The agenda is set. Hello, everyone. I'm Brent Goff in Berlin. Today on the show, how much should you be paid? Now, the bosses of the digital economy often say zero. Today, getting something for nothing. Aren't you glad you got out of bed? It's time to talk. They're creative, educated, and unpaid. The new economy's new poor. A workforce expected to give their time and effort for peanuts in return. Today, we ask, when will something give? Well, who's afraid of fracking? A revolution in the oil and natural gas industry is underway, and the Germans are scared. Their fears are not unfounded. Fracking can be dangerous to the environment and to people, but some say safety is possible. So why is Berlin frozen on fracking? And remember the scenes from Star Trek? The captain wants a martini, and he simply tells the computer to make one. Well, we are closer to being Captain Kirk than ever before. A revolution in manufacturing. Thanks to 3D printers, even guns can now be made in the comfort of your own home. You see it right there. But what on earth does, does this mean for keeping the peace and for keeping people employed? Well, I've invited three people today to talk, argue, and pry apart these headlines. My first guest is on the frontier of 3D printing technology. He leads workshops right here in Berlin on using 3D printers, and he says this technology is not ushering in a new industrial revolution. I'm happy to welcome to the show Bram de Vries. He is a 3D printer engineer. Bram, you got to explain yourself here. You say um, you know we can print at home. We don't even need a manufacturer anymore. So how can you say this is not a revolution? It is a revolution, but it's often described as a revolution that's going to replace everything as uh, when it comes to manufacturing. But I say it's going to add up to all the other things that we have been doing till now. So I don't think it will replace metal machining or the martini factory. Okay, the martini factory. Yeah, we're going to talk about getting that martini on the Starship Enterprise in just a second. Good to have you on the show, Brom. My second guest says that fracking is simply too dangerous and should be forbidden here in Germany. I'm happy to welcome to the show Oliver Krischer. He is a member of Germany's parliament and he is the Green Party's go-to man on all fracking issues. Oliver, the Americans are fracking. Poland is fracking. What do you know that they don't know? I yeah, think, think it's not a game changer in Germany, it's uh, not a game changer even in whole Europe, also not in uh, Poland, uh, because um, the reserves uh, of, uh, the of uh, shale gas are very low in Germany and uh, we have uh, decided in Germany to go to 100% renewables. That's our way of future energy supply mm -hmm. and uh, fracking is a new technology with many, many risks for groundwater for all these things uh, and, and I think uh, it uh, will no good solution for Germany. All right, well, we're going we're gonna to talk about the people who say it is a solution um, in just a moment. Glad that you can be on the show. My next guest wakes up every day and searches for the best talent in the tech industry, and he admits that not everyone gets paid for their work. I'm happy to welcome to the show Jeremy Del Ducisi. He is a Silicon Valley tech recruiter based here in Berlin. Correct. Right, Jeremy? Yep. Um, is there an accepted code? in the digital economy that says it's okay to exploit this, this large young talent pool? I mean, should they work for no pay and just get used to it? No, I don't, I don't feel there is an accepted code. Um, in short, there are just too many uh, positions, there are too many jobs, opportunities open to the youth of today in the digital economy. And there is too much need for talent in the digital economy. So. I don't feel there is a code, no. So you, you mean the supply is greater than the demand right Absolutely. now? Absolutely. All right, all right. I mean, that, that is one argument. Um, I have to admit that I was shocked when we began researching just how many people are expected to work for free in the digital economy. A survey in Australia found that 40% of interns in the creative industries, advertising, social media, PR, felt that they had been exploited more than 75% said that they never received a dime for their work. Now, all kinds of internet companies tell young people that it's experience that matters most now. Come work for us, build up your resume, but don't expect to be paid. That's fine if your wallet is already fat, but for the lower and the middle class, 
It's tantamount to another great wall in the new economy, a wall between the haves and the have-nots. The digital economy has the potential to create jobs while some economies flounder in recession. Much of the new economy is based on freelance workers. For growing numbers of people, going to work doesn't involve sitting in an office. A laptop and an internet connection is all they need. Sitting in a cafe, it's possible to write articles, edit videos and upload music. But this work is often badly paid or not paid at all. As old industries get replaced by new internet companies, is there enough work to go around? Are we swapping real jobs for unpaid labor? I mean, is that what is happening now, Jeremy? Is you've got these, these high-tech companies, the internet companies, I mean, they are making lots of money right now. Mm. Are they doing it on the backs of digital serfs, I mean, cheap labor? Well, I can only really speak for what I've seen. And uh, I, know, I have heard some absolute horror stories before, especially of some of them larger, more established internet companies that do make people work uh, either from home or on site for 12 hours a day with very little or no, or no pay. So it does happen. But um, a, lot of the, a lot of my experience is working with smaller startups, for example, with uh, very little capital behind them. And these companies need to bring on talent for you know, as cheap as possible, basically. And they do generally provide an atmosphere in which people can flourish, where they can, you know, where they can do an internship and they can move into more senior positions, into a full-time position I mean, later on down the line. I, I, think, I, think, I think most people, too, would, would agree with you that with a startup company, they could understand. They want to bring in interns. You know, they have their startup capital, but that's it. I mean, yeah. it's going to be a while before they actually turn a profit. Um, but what about established companies that have a strong bottom line. Hmm. How do they justify having people come in for internships, working and not paying them anything? I mean, you, you can't really, you can't justify that. If you're bringing people in, if you have good ethics and you bring people in and you pay them and you provide them a platform in which to, in which to flourish, I mean, there are plenty of jobs available. And as I said before, very, even in bigger companies, very high um, demand and very low supply. Mm -hmm. But uh, if they're doing this, no, I don't, I don't think, um, I think that's terribly wrong. And I have heard horror stories before, but they've only been far and few between in my experience. Uh, uh, give us an example of a horror story. Um, well, I mean, uh, recently a CEO uh, in Germany came up to me and, you know, boasted how easy it was for him to bring interns, on, interns in and how cheap it was for him to do so and how that, you know, a large percentage of his workforce were, were just interns. Um, and I've also heard stories from big companies in Berlin um, that, you know, again, they do the same thing. They exploit, they exploit youngsters and make them work ridiculous hours for very little. What's the policy at your company? Uh, on our company, well, we're a very small company, but we hire um, two interns. Um, we have our two interns so far. One, we, you know, we pay them both very well for interns. One, we turned into a full-time position uh, within three months, and the next one we're about to do as well, turn into a full-time position. So can an intern work um, for you and expect to be hired? Yes, absolutely. I mean, 100% record so far, so mm -hmm. I think that's very possible. Yeah, I yeah. mean, true. But your office here is very new, though, right? Absolutely. Right. But, you know, for us, I mean, we know, especially in the recruitment world, we know it's difficult to find people who have experience in digital entertainment, so it's hard to hire experienced people. And also, I'd rather mold people. So it's better for us to hire interns, mold them into the company, and then give them the opportunity to flourish. I, I got to ask you something um, about your company. I was looking at your website mm. earlier today. Your website um, has this page where it lists the values of the company. Absolutely. And it lists 44 values, Yes. Um, and which are interesting. I mean, um, creativity, being cool, uh, being committed to your job, being green. Yeah. Not once on the website, though, is fair pay listed as a value of your company. Mm. Um, I mean, I believe that people do get paid very fairly in our company. Um, I mean, I know how much our interns get paid, and I feel that everyone's treated very fairly. I've never heard any gripes before, but uh, yeah, maybe that's something we should look at. <laughs> I mean, it, it, yeah. isn't it part of the industry, though, Jeremy, that there is this push towards the bottom? I mean, we, you know, we talk, we've got interns here mm. as well. I mean, I talk to people in journalism, in advertising, social media, and the talk is always they're paid the bare minimum mm. and expected to perform, you know, 150%. Um, 
Does it that come out of the nature of the internet where everything appears to be free? Mm, I don't know. I mean, I, everything is not free on the internet, right? Um, yeah, but, I mean, but yeah. labor is treated that way right mm. now, isn't it? I, I don't know. I, th I, th I think there's too much. I mean, I think that senior professionals, let's, let's move on to senior people yeah. in the industry, get paid very fairly um, con considering their skill sets and where they live, and obviously depends entirely on locations. Um, but uh, I think there is a good opportunity for young people to move up into senior positions very, very quickly. Um, and I think for a lot of these startups as well, you've got to understand these are, these are very exciting companies. You know, in the height of technology is what we use on a day-to-day -day basis. We play with games. We use apps, you know. Mm -hmm. These are very exciting opportunities for a lot of people to get experience. And from what I understand, the experience they gain is invaluable, you know. Um, yeah, but how do they pay their rent? <sighs> Difficult. Uh, it's a difficult question. I mean, for, from our perspective, I, I don't know how they pay the rent. But I mean, from our perspective, I, we pay people. I mean, so I'm, I'm just yeah. I'm just wondering um, what kind of people you can attract in in the digital economy if, if if you're not paying. I mean, your company may be an exception, but generally there are a lot of unpaid internships. Mm. So who can afford to come and work for you? Um, then these are going to have to be well-heeled young people who have just come out of the university or who are still studying. But that's a certain social class, right? I mean, yeah. these, these are upper class people who already have money. What happens to the middle class and the lower class young people who want to get a foot in the door? I mean, they are blocked, you know, they're blocked immediately, aren't they? Well, I think one of the arguments I read in the Guardian uh, article was that the uh, that there were basically a lot of these tech companies were looking you know were were siding with universities and educational institutions, um, and basically it was becoming a profit wagon. You know these uh -huh. these 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 universities were handpicking the best rich students out of these universities and no one else was getting a look in, basically. Mm -hmm. um, and that probably certainly happens in in Bay Area, and perhaps to some extent in London as well. But I think uh, in Berlin um, and the parts of Europe where I have experience in, that doesn't really happen. And I think it's just an accepted, it's an accepted thing that you have to go for an internship in order to, to step up the ladder. And you have to accept the fact that you might not be paid. Brum, what's your experience? I mean, you know, you're a part of this, of this new economy. What, I mean, what do you see? Do you see a lot of people working for free? Yeah. But it's, uh, I don't think, at least people that I know, are not exploited by big companies. It's more that you, as a freelancer, you have to do all the things. And most of the freelancers start from what they like to do, which is mostly technological-based kind of things to do. And then the whole finance side around it is it's a bit more tricky. Uh, yeah, at I mean, least my experience. Yeah, but why? Really but why? It. Why is it tricky, though? I mean, if I go to work uh, for an established non-new economy company, I know that I can go in and I can negotiate, and that I'm going to get at least a decent salary. Why is it different in the new economy? What, I mean, what's going on here? Isn't isn't everyone drinking from this Kool-Aid? and believing that because everything on the internet is open and free, labor is also going to be free. I mean, isn't that what we're telling ourselves? No, I, I don't believe that. Um, I mean, I think, I think there are certain situations where that is true, but I think if you're looking, talking generally speaking, that's not, that's not a rule. Um, things on the internet, I mean, a lot of these companies on the internet don't make money at all, right? They offer free products and they have absolutely no way of monetizing it, or they don't have a, a good understanding of how to monetize something. Yeah. You have a bunch of 25 year old geeks coming out of college, you know, university, who are starting up their company for the first time, uh, and, and a lot of them have very little, if none, no business sense whatsoever. Um, and they don't understand how to monetize a platform. They can build something brilliant, but they don't have to monetize it. Um, and the way I like to look but at it. Not, but yeah. that's not an excuse for not paying the people who work for you, though, right? Well, it depends what you can afford to pay. I mean, it, it really depends if you can afford to pay people to work for you or whether you sell them the dream that we're building something cool, stick with us. Yeah, uh, I mean, but that's, what I, that's yeah. what I say when I talk about drinking from the, from the same Kool-Aid, yeah. that we're believing we're, on some, we're a part of something that's new and big, but at the end of the day, you know, our bank accounts are, you know, there's a big fat zero. Mm. I, mean, I mean, do you think that there needs to be some type of regulation Possibly, yeah. I mean, I think that for bigger companies, they, there probably should be some type of regulation. I think, for example, with uh, with interns bringing free people in, they should be a lim very limited amount of time of, of what they can work. There should be a clear plan of how they can proceed within the company, yeah. um, so they know from day one which direction they're going. Yeah. Um, I think that's very important. 
um, as well. I think also that like, educational institutions could probably do a lot more to prepare people for how to work in this industry, mm -hmm. you know, to how to get ahead, to how to network effectively using the tools that we're talking about, like yeah. social networking tools. Yeah, but, I mean, I don't know how, you know, your university yeah. professor can prepare you to work for free. Yeah. I mean, Oliver, let me ask you, I mean, you're a man from the Greens. The Greens are the champions of the new economy, of, of the, you know, the digital economy, these young workers. Is it is there a role for the state, for the government, to step in to make sure that this, this new age exploitation does not get worse? Yes, certainly there should be the general rule that people who are working get wages um, they can uh, support their lives from. That uh, I think that's, that's essential, that uh, if old and new economy, that should be a general rule. But um, I think I have, I have the same impression uh, that there is um, always, if there is a new economy, people are starting very optimistic, small companies, and then uh, they work uh, without uh, getting money because um, they, they um, uh, expect a chance for the future life and uh, uh, because of that uh, they can be exploited and I think um, it's it's a it's a task uh, for for the government for the for, for the state in general to look on this uh. isn't the state behind on this though I mean aren't these developments aren't these things happening so quickly that you guys just can't keep up with it? Certainly, if, if it's, it's not always possible because we have very many small companies and uh, it's, it's, it's impossible. And there's uh, no to, trade to union, everywhere. there's no but, trade union for yeah, these yes, people, that's, right? That's, I think uh, there will be a, a development in the future, um, as we um, saw it in the past already in other parts of the economic, uh, that if the companies get bigger, then the trade unions and the organization uh, in, in, like uh, Betriebsrat in Germany, they, they will yeah, the come up council, and, the, yeah. Yeah, and they will organize it. And um, there will be chance, but uh, uh, it, I think it's one important point you already said. Uh, there is a general uh, discussion, a general feeling. Uh, Internet is all free, and uh, um, uh, this uh, will be uh, at, at least a part uh, of the economic problem to pay the people. Yeah. Because um, uh, uh, I, I look, for example, I look at my son. He always says uh, everything has to be free on the Internet. And uh, but I say, uh, you guy, uh, uh, there there should be people who make it who who. Uh, who have uh, to spend their hours uh, to develop it, and, and certainly uh, they have to be paid. And, and isn't, it can't be and free all are, are, And aren't we guilty ourselves of that? I mean, we go on the internet. I mean, I, you know, I did tons of research. There's tons of things written about um, new economy worker exploitation here. I mean, it's like a mountain. Um, but we go on the internet and expect to get all of this information for free. Mm -hmm. So um, there's a price to be paid for getting stuff that's free, isn't there? And I mean, how can I get all this information for free if the people producing it are going to be paid? So aren't the consumers at the end of the day, aren't we responsible for the exploitation that's happening? No, not at all. I mean, you, if you, I mean, for, first of all, give me, um, give me, can you give me an example of what you mean by something free? Give me an example. Well, of I mean, let's, let's say, I mean, we're running out of time, but uh, let's, let's make it brief. Um, you know, let's say you go on, you do a search on Google. Right. You want to look up, you know, digital economy, worker exploitation. Tons of articles are written there. You have access to them. I didn't have to pay a dime mm. for any of these articles. Now, these articles are all works of journalists. Yeah. They're not receiving a dime for, for, for me having access to that. Isn't that wrong? That is, yeah, I mean, I, I think that is wrong. Um, these are not the people that I work with on a day-to-day -day basis, so I can't speak for them or how much they get paid at all. I, I, we I don't. brought you in because you're a good guy, Jerry. <laughs> <laughs> you know. Thank you, I have to confess that. But I think, um, no, I think that is, that is wrong. I mean, the people that we work with are the tech guys and the product guys, and they get paid a great deal for doing the what specialists. they do. Yeah, these yeah. are the specialists. So. All right. They're, they're, they're not the, the creative guys. Yeah, no. I mean, this is yeah, something we can talk about. I'm sure we'll be talking about this. Um, again um, in the near future because the whole issue with representation in trade unions that is a chapter that has yet to be written but let's move on we want to go to something um, that gets more towards uh, to the core talking about money and that is fracking now fracking is politically radioactive here in germany the government has tabled any discussion on a fracking law until after the national election in september are politicians here tuning out the rest of the world? The International Energy Agency says that we are in a golden age of natural gas and that if countries move forward with fracking carefully, energy prices will fall, jobs will be created, and the reliance on fossil fuels from unstable regions such as the Middle East could be over within a decade. In the U.S., a fracking boom is underway. 
The technology has led to a leap in production of oil and gas, pushing down prices at home and boosting the country's exports. But not everyone's happy. Critics say fracking is dangerous and bad for the environment. It involves using fluids to break up the ground to get at the gas and oil underneath. There are worries it can lead to gas leaks, contamination, even earthquakes. Concerns like these are one reason Europe is lagging a long way behind the U.S. In Poland and the U.K., drilling is at an exploratory stage. But France has banned fracking. In Germany, politicians have decided to put off a decision to allow it on a commercial scale until after elections in September. Oliver, what happens after the election? Is it going to be yes or no to fracking? I think uh, it will be a no because um, fracking is no solution for Germany and uh, I see a big majority in parliament, uh, especially from the left side of the parliament but also in the conservative side of the parliament uh, that they uh, don't uh, want fracking because um, it's no solution for our energy questions. Okay, but l let's, let's talk about why it's no solution for Germany. The Americans are going full steam ahead with it and they expect to be energy independent by the end of this decade. Yeah, I mean, that has to be a role model for Germany. Yeah, but um, uh, the U.S. is the only country in the world who is it doing now at the moment. And uh, you have to look on uh, European geology. It's quite different from the U.S. Uh, our reserves are much lower, as um, uh, mining experts uh, tell us. So um, uh, there will need, uh, there if also if we w say, yes, we do fracking and we go on, there won't be such a boom as in the U.S. And uh, certainly but there are many signs uh, that the U.S boom is a very short-term boom and um, uh, we are not sure I mean I, Oliver I don't know about that now I mean if we look at the numbers mm -hmm. the International Energy Agency um, they their 2012 reports mm -hmm. come out and they're talking about this golden age of natural gas the United States is about to become an exporter of natural gas Germans are paying seven times more for natural gas right now than Americans are paying. Yeah, I mean, how, how do you tell your voters, how do you explain your vote to your voters that Americans have this incredibly cheap natural gas, but you have to buy from the Russians and you have to pay a premium of seven times what the Americans pay? Uh, energy was always cheaper in the U.S. than in Europe. That's, that's uh, no, no phenomenon of uh, fracking. Um, um, I have to tell my, my voters and the people living in Germany um, that uh, the, the, the reserves we have in, in the soil of Germany is so low that it's no game changer. If we, we take all everything out with all the risk of pollution and so on, with even earthquakes, with climate questions, it wouldn't uh, change German uh, uh, energy prices. Our mining companies themselves say this. So in in about Germany, it's, it's only a question uh, to get uh, uh, some a little amount of gas from the soil, and uh, the, the risk and the, the costs of the pollution is, uh, in, in, in our eyes, it's much higher. Okay. It is worse to take it so out. So let's say then, okay, the, the geology in Germany is not ideal. Let, let's, let's assume that that's true. Um, you're still obviously looking for ways to lower energy costs for people in Germany. The United States is uh, probably by the end of this decade will be able to export liquefied natural gas all over the world. Is Germany going to be one of the first customers to buy that? Uh, I think um, we, we all, it's, Germany is a country which has to import uh, gas in the next uh, um, decades, uh, that's certainly obvious, but uh, I don't believe uh, that we will import uh, gas from the U.S. And I will, I'm not sure if the development well, the, in the, the U.S. The International Energy Agency yeah, there, says there that's also, where we're For headed. example, the Energy Watch Group, another international group of other experts, says uh, it will be a very short term and they don't believe that uh, the U.S. in the end uh, will export a huge amount of gas and uh, so um, uh, I, I, I don't see uh, this development uh, that there will uh, uh, come gas from the US uh, to Europe. Uh, certainly there is uh, uh, much gas from other countries, from Norway, from Qatar, from, from Russia uh, on the European market and uh, there, there's enough supply for us, payable supply. But, uh, so uh, that, I mean, that As that a politician, I don't, don't Oliver, how, how do you tell your voters that you're going to push a policy that says we'd rather buy from Russia 
or Qatar or Saudi Arabia, mm -hmm. when you've got the United States, a, an ally, mm -hmm. a peaceful ally, mm -hmm. that's willing to sell you natural gas below the price that you're going to get from the Russians. Yeah, it's I, no mean, I, mean, I, I, don't, I don't see it at the moment. It's, it's, it's an unreal discussion that we import from the US. The discussion in Germany is how to take gas out of the German soil. That's the discussion at the moment. And uh, as nearly but, but, but you said yourself no, 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 that's no, no, not no. going to happen that's, though, that's, right? That's, don't, don't, uh, nearly but, all European countries, uh, as France, yeah. uh, as Sweden, as the Netherlands, most countries say we don't. Uh, we we are we we, uh, we are very we are not optimistic. We we, we don't uh, believe in uh, this technology. So uh, um, that that is a discussion at the moment. I uh, it's it's a decision of the U.S. Uh, to go to make their own energy politics. That's uh, certainly okay. If they export now, now they are not doing it. it it's only, I think, uh, I, my opinion, it's a wish. Other people say it will be the future. But uh, if they do it, um, uh, then it's a new discussion, certainly. Uh, but uh, um, uh, but Germany, I'm asking you, what, what did the Greens say about that? I mean, that's an interesting proposition, isn't it, Oliver? If the United States can sell natural gas to you, you no longer have to buy from the Russians. The Russians use energy as a political weapon. Now, common sense would tell you it would be better to buy from Uncle Sam than to buy from the Kremlin. The most amount of gas we buy is from the Netherlands and it's from Norway in Germany. And uh, um, so uh, I, I don't see that these countries use that as a political weapon. Um, uh, or if, uh, if Russia uses that as a political weapon to Germany, I didn't get that. It is different well, you know, to other countries. We've had several winters where they have turned delivery of oil off and it has impacted the reserves in Germany. It, it's happened at least twice. I mean, even your party has come out and said that they are alarmed by how Russia uses the energy card. I mean, my it's question is... But, but we are looking on the general development. We are talking about years and decades. Yeah. And uh, our, it's our, our, our uh, task uh, as Greens, as, uh, and it is a general decision in Germany, to, to ban all fossil energies and to come to renewable. That's the most task. And, and, and we have talked uh, about uh, um, uh, the fact that we can uh, produce our energy from our own, from renewable energies. Mm -hmm. and think uh, that is the most important factor, the, the most important thing we t have to talk about. Certainly, if you import fossil energy from any country of the world, uh, they have, uh, there are impacts, uh, negative impacts, uh, uh, um, uh, as we take it from, uh, from the US, it's an impact of fracking. Uh, if we import it from Russia, you can say that's no democratic state, and so on. So we have uh, decided to produce our energy from our own as renewables, and that, that's the most important. What do you say about the, the International um, Energy Agency um, says the good news about, about fracking is that the risks are manageable, that if companies and states follow a list of golden rules for this golden age, consumers can count on safe, cheaper energy. I mean, the, you know, the IAE is saying that. <laughs> the IAE is um, an institution uh, that um, uh, uh, um, negotiates in the past uh, that there will be any problems with fossil energies. Uh, they um, uh, didn't even talk about renewables in the past. Uh, I, th they gave many advisors uh, um, which uh, were wrong, uh, which showed wrong in the past. Uh, they changed their opinion to nuclear energy in the last. So uh, uh, I read this uh, was, was interesting eyes uh, but uh, it's not a bible for me and um, uh, if um, I see I went uh, to the US uh, to Pennsylvania yeah. and looked there what's going on with fracking and I met many people there who uh, say oh that's that's no good decision as maybe they're the majority in in, uh, in the US population who says it's okay we do we uh, we go this way but I also see that there are many people who say that's the wrong way that we should uh, go uh, another way and um, what what is happening in the US that they are uh, develop the, the the technology learning by doing and uh, by this they produce polluted ground, they, pollu they produce polluted landscape, and I think this is the wrong way. It's, it's, it's not okay to, to, to use our environment as a test field for, but for such the, a technology. You know, but okay, well, Germany is getting out of nuclear power, but during the transition, I mean, you say the goal is to have 100% renewable energy sources, but in order to get to that point, 
there, most of the energy companies are in agreement that Germany will have to import electricity at some time. It may come from France, which generates 80% of its electricity with nuclear power. Um, are, are you, as a member of the Green Party, are you willing to say that along the way to getting to 100% renewables, it is okay to tap into energy sources that we are against. It's, it's a fairy tale that uh, we have to import uh, energy from uh, France, from nuclear power. Uh, it's, it's quite the opposite. Uh, uh, Germany is exporting electri uh, um, uh, um, electric energy in, in many other countries of Europe. We, we produce much more electricity than we use in Germany because of the development of the so renewables. So the transition to renewables so is not going to be a problem? If, if, with there, no there, cracking either. There, there, have to be, uh, there, have to, uh, there has to be a, a frame that we are working on. There are many discussions. There are certainly a problem. But uh, the development is going on. For example, 10 years ago, we had 4% uh, renewables uh, in, in, the, um, in the energy uh, system. Now we have 25%. Nobody, nobody in Germany expected this uh, development. There were many groups for example, like the EAA, it was one group who said it's not possible for Germany to get uh, more than 4 or 5 percent. Now we have 25 uh, percent and the development goes on. We have to steer it, we have to, to manage it. It's a complicated process. Mm -hmm. But I don't see the development that we have to import nuclear electricity from frost, for example. Okay. It's in, in, in the last winters, it was quite opposite. Well, uh, we I mean, exported electricity Oliver, to I mean, frost. We have to wrap up. I'm going to bring you back on this show a year from now and we're going to look <laughs> at the the transition and um, we're going to see what the import of energy picture what that looks like um, anyway we have to move on and we want to talk about something um, that requires energy and um, the question is are we about to witness the end of the manufacturing economy I wonder if that could go hand in hand with all the renewables will factories one day be a ghost of the first industrial revolution now that could very well be the case if you believe in the potential of 3D printing. Imagine having a printer at home that can basically print anything that you have the blueprint for. Furniture, appliances, even medication. Well, the technology is already here. It still has a ways to go, but it has already made a big bang, literally. 3D printers have been hailed as a revolution in manufacturing. The technology allows objects to be printed layer by layer, usually using plastic. It's also possible to print with rubber, glass, and ceramics. Initially expensive, 3D printers are getting cheaper. Thanks to technology, it's possible to download designs from the internet and produce objects at home instead of buying them. Recently, it stirred controversy when an American designed and printed a gun. So, what does the future hold for 3D printing? Will it revolutionize the economy and pave the way for a second industrial revolution? Or is it all just hype? Yeah, what do you say, Brom? Is it all just a bunch of hype? I mean, you're a 3D man. Uh, no, I don't think it's all just a bunch of hype, but I think it's um, not really understood completely by the media and uh, some, some people write a bit too optimistically about it. In my where, are we, where are we too optimistic? Um, it is, uh, it is a, uh, you should understand 3D printing as a very flexible and versatile way of manufacturing things. It is rather not a very efficient way of producing things. So if you want to have many of the same things, it is much better to use traditional methods like injection molding, uh, where you want to have something... Uh, but, and that's, like, that's like what we need a factory for today, yes. right, right. We're not talking about a printer at home. Right, but what could we use right now? I mean, what things do we need that, that we could print at home right now? I mean, you've brought some... What can do now? Yeah, show uh, us what you've brought in today. I mean, um, if we can get that on plastic camera. Plastic gadgets, basically, and 3D printers. <laughs> All right, I mean, so th this is what? This is like a cup or, or, or a flower this, vase? This is a cup or a vase or a candle holder. I, someone designed it. I downloaded it from the Internet. I printed it. Same for this chain, and you can do some funny but tricks you know, with show it. Show that, because, I mean, a lot of people were saying we could use this as Mardi Gras, as a necklace. For example. I mean, what do you think about this? If it were green, Oliver, would you wear it? <laughs> green would be better color for it, but it's a nice thing. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I can also print it in green. Uh, you no can print problem. it in green. Yeah. Okay. 
And tell me the, about your penguin here. Yeah, it is. Around. I made a little penguin and I printed it. And uh, so that is, um, it's, it's rather complex shapes. Uh, you can do interesting things it's, with it's it. It's actually very heavy. I mean, it's not, I mean, if people think it, it, you know, you're printing something, there's no paper here, right? I mean, this is plastic. hard plastic. Yeah. But it's biodegradable plastic. It's PLA, uh, so it's not made out of oil. Uh, it's not synthetic. It's made out of uh, corn or corn, rests of corn, and then fermented and then turns into this plastic. Um, you said you downloaded all of this from the internet. Yes. Um, is the internet the key to the success of 3D printing? It is, because objects become more and more digital, so uh, it requires no labor or special skills to make an exact copy uh, this of, of this object in, uh, say, New York. I can just email it to someone in New York, or the, the guy downloads it, and on his printer or her printer, prints the same thing. Did you have to pay for the blueprints for any of these? No, it is mainly hobbyists who do it, so it's not exploitation if you are going to that direction. It is... Uh, well, my question is, if you were to walk into a store and buy and see this, you would have to pay for it. Yes. But you didn't pay for this. You printed it at home. I designed it myself, but if I also put it on the internet, and if you put things on the internet, you can attach a Creative Commons license to it. For example, if I would have Okay, my penguin, for example, I can say, okay, you can print it for your own use, but you cannot make a business out of it. It's like a Creative Commons license. Is there, is there any way, like, is there any way to, you know, protect intellectual property or copyrights on, on, on products? Um, does, does 3D printing threaten, you know, the legal protections that we have now? Not so much yet, because uh, 3D printing is also a way of making things, and it has different rules as other ways of making things and um, uh, it's, it's kind of difficult for example if I would like to steal the intellectual property of this glass to exactly produce it on, on my 3D printer it will change a bit more if products are more designed for 3D printing which is not the case yet now still this is made designed for uh, for glass manufacturing which is a big factory where you can do different things as on your 3D printer but there is it possible, it's possible right now though to go onto the internet and to find the blueprint for certain things, to download that and, and to print them, correct? Yes. Um, and there are a lot of things that are free. Yes. As this technology advances, do you see though a dilemma? Let's say, um, let's say I do want to print this glass mm -hmm. and the technology is there. What is going to prevent me from printing this glass without paying for it? Difficult. Uh, still, yeah, okay, you can print glass, that's true. Uh, it's still pretty expensive machines, uh, so more for industrial use. Uh, and if, if there's not so much of, of preventing it, it's, it's the same. It's the wild west of the internet that we've been talking about yeah, earlier, it's, isn't it? It's the it? same thing. It's, it's also with the same problem with music and, and, and movies. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's pretty difficult Jeremy, to stop what, what sharing do you, of What do you say about this? I mean, this is well, very disruptive, isn't it? This, is going, this could turn manufacturing on its head, couldn't it? I mean, it, it, it could. I mean, I don't know where we are with capabilities of these printers yet, and I don't know what materials. I mean, I'm assuming it's just plastics you can use and not, basically, is it? Yeah. Basically, just plastics, yeah. At home. And I'm not sure how long it will take to, to get to the point where we can actually sit at home and make whatever we want, you know, I fancy a donut or a glass or something like that, and you could just print it out like this, you know? Um, but, yeah, I mean, there could be a problem, but, you know, they could also provide a link to a PayPal account as well, and people well, could pay for it. that's yeah. what I'm thinking too. Yeah. And, um, you know, Oliver, let me ask you, what, would, what role does the state have in all of this? Um, there's, there, ha there has to be some type of regulation, right? I mean, you could put, in theory, you could put all types of, 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 of companies out of business with this technology. You need to, I think, um, uh, if I understand it right, you need um, uh, some blueprints, you need um, uh, the program uh, um, uh, to, to get from the internet. And so we have the regulation that you have to pay for the program. And then certainly it's, uh, um, it's, an, uh, it's an opportunity, it's a possibility to produce it by the uh, 3D printer of your own. Um, I think uh, that's the next step of um, uh, uh, industrial production. If you only take um, the blueprint, pay for it, and then uh, uh, you can use it uh, as you want. I think um, that's, that's a de development you can stop in the end. Okay, you know, we're running out of time, Brad, but tell us, how long did it take the printer to actually make this when it started printing? 
Something like 12 hours or so. 12 hours. Oh, that's a long time. I don't have to work for it. I usually have my printer running overnight to produce stuff for my workshops in building 3D printers. Uh, many of the plastic parts are also are produced by 3D printers as well. So it is, it's quite a time demanding process, but it's, uh, it doesn't require labor because it's just a computer um, uh, executing all the... Uh, right, I mean, so there's no, one, there's no one manufacturing this. Exactly, and that's also the hope uh, of, of... I mean, uh, the Chinese, for example, I mean, they have to be worried about this, right? The factory of the world, they're not going to be needed anymore if, we, if we're all China able to do this at really home. really diving into 3D printing. They, uh, they really put a lot of innovation capacity into 3D printing. It's not advanced enough to it's be a threat yet. Enough, right? You can't be yeah. a threat yet. We're I mean, we're all kind of sitting here astounded yeah. by this, but I mean, I know a lot of people are writing on this. They're sounding the alarm, and they're calling on people like you, Oliver, to step in to make sure this doesn't get out of control. Is our politicians going to be able to make sure that this does not destroy the manufacturing world as we know it? I think if, at the moment, as I, if I understand it right, it's only by plastic. So you get only things you get in a one euro shop, for example. Yeah. And it's certainly more expensive to produce this 12 hours by a 3D pin, uh, printer than go in a one euro shop and buy it from a Chinese from a company which has produced it in yeah. in, 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 in China. So um, I think it, it will de it will depend on um, the development. If there are yep. other products, other materials have, inside, they think we have to wrap it up. Anyway, we'll see. I mean, maybe we can sell this at the next Mardi Gras and see how much money we can make with it. <laughs> Brom, gentlemen, thank you very much for being on the show. That's going to wrap up my agenda this week. Don't forget that you can watch the show again on our website and on YouTube. And don't be shy. Tell us what you think. Our inbox is always open. I'm Brent Goff in Berlin. And join me next time when I set the agenda.